So, uh, hello everybody, uh, and sorry for the, uh, for the technical uh, delay. Uh, we are now ready to start uh, this, uh, this discussion from viruses to wars, recent disruptions to global trade and value chains. I'm Andre Sapir, a senior fellow here uh, at Bruegel, and I'm happy to welcome uh, Adil Mohammed, uh, an economist from the research department at the IMF, who has authored, co-authored a, a very interesting uh, report on uh, what has been the impact of the pandemic uh, on uh, global value chains. So let me let me give a, a word of uh, a word of introduction uh, to this uh, to this discussion. Uh, if we look at the last uh, 50 years, say, uh, I think we have had three periods of uh, globalization. Not going back to the uh, you know the first phase of globalization in the uh, middle of the 19th century up to First World War, but you know over the past 50 years, I would say there was a period that ended more or less with 1989-1990. Uh, that is the changes, the political changes that took place in the, uh, in the communist countries, uh, Soviet Union, the Soviet bloc, and also in, uh, in China. And then in the 1990s uh, and the early 2000s, uh, the former communist countries became members first of the IMF, then the World Bank, and then the GATT WTO, with China joining the WTO in, in 2001 and Russia uh, a couple of years later. And that period that started roughly in the early 1990s with liberalization of the, uh, of the economies and some of those economies that had been close to the rest of the world that had been more or less operating in autarky and joining the global, the global system and the global trading, uh, trading regime, uh, that period uh, starting in early 1990 uh, is what we often refer to as the period of hyper-globalization. There was an acceleration of, uh, of trade and much of the acceleration of trade was linked to global value chains. Uh, one usually thinks that 50 percent uh, of trade uh, today, especially in manufacturing, is trade which, of, which is of the sort of global value chain with a lot of intermediate product being traded and often within uh, multinational corporations. And then comes the financial crisis. Starting in 2008, the collapse of uh, global trade in 2009, collapse also of global value chains, and much interrogation uh, among uh, trade, uh, trade observers uh, as to whether this would be a very short interruption and would the trend of hyper-globalization restart after the, f the financial crisis. And what we observed is that, um, sure, the, 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 the situation of 2009 was short-lived but at the same time, we never went back to the trend that was the trend from before the financial crisis. We stayed at high level of globalization, but the trend towards more globalization, more hyper-globalization didn't continue. And according to you know, whatever indicators you look at, you see that there was already a tapering, uh, tapering down. And then comes the pandemic, 2020. Again, 2020 was obviously a very bad year, not just for global GDP, also for global trade. And again, the question uh, about global value chains uh, was raised. And again now, obviously in the last few months, with the war in, uh, in Ukraine and Russia, that comes at a time where clearly the pandemic is not fully over and the difficulties that we are observing in China. So the future of globalization is very much linked to the future of global value chains. Uh, it's th th those, two, those two issues, and you know, it's full of articles. You know, are we, have we entered in a period of deglobalization? Does it mean, therefore, we have entered into a period where global value chains are not going to play uh, the same role as in the past? So I think we are very eager to hear from uh, Adil uh, 
and from the uh, IMF uh, report, uh, what is the findings uh, about the situation during the pandemic? And then we'll get into, uh, into a discussion. Uh, unfortunately, we will not have with us uh, Dalia Marin. We had some technical uh, difficulties. And Dalia would have brought her expertise. Uh, Dalia is a fellow uh, here at Brugge, but pr a professor in uh, Munich, who has worked a lot on uh, issues of offshoring and onshoring. Yeah, has there been a, a, a process of reshoring due to uh, some of the, the decisions? So, Adil, I'm turning to you uh, to hear about what are the findings from your, your report, and then we'll get into a discussion. And I will also invite uh, our audience uh, to connect to Slido, so the uh, application. And uh, on Slido, you can connect by using the three uh, uh, letters G, V, C, and you can ask uh, questions. So Adil, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. Uh, for the opportunity to uh, present uh, our work here today and uh, to invite us here. I'm very, very pleased. Um, the, uh, I just want to make sure that uh, I can, ah, perfect. So, um, so this, uh, this is chapter four of the spring 2022 uh, VO titled Global Trade and Value Chains uh, in the Pandemic. Uh, this was uh, produced by a team of economists in the research department, uh, including myself. So let me uh, jump right into it and maybe set the scene with some of the uh, stylized facts uh, surrounding trade in the pandemic that inform the questions uh, that we have asked in this report. Uh, so when the pandemic first broke out, uh, in some observers' view, given the fact that the pandemic was a twin demand and supply shock, it was expected that uh, trade would suffer quite a dramatic collapse perhaps even worse than what was uh, witnessed in the, um, in the global financial crisis, the so-called great trade collapse. However, what we observe in the data is that although there was a very sharp decline in trade volumes at the, out at the onset of the pandemic, there was also a very rapid recovery, unlike what has happened in the past. So this is what we show in the chart on the left. If you look at the uh, yellow line, which shows import volumes in quarters following the onset of the crisis of the pandemic, um, very quickly after that, it seems to import volumes recover to pre-pandemic levels. In contrast, when you look at the red line, which is, the, uh, which is imports uh, uh, during uh, in quarters before and after the global financial crisis, you observe that there was a much more protracted recovery. Uh, now that's one part of the story and that there is heterogeneity in that recovery story between trade in goods and trade in services. So if we look over to the chart on the right, uh, you will see that this rapid recovery in trade is something that we see very clearly in the trade in goods, which is the blue line. So trade in goods fell uh, at the onset of the pandemic uh, by about 12.5% in volume terms by the middle of 2020, but by October 2020, it had recovered to pre-pandemic levels. But in contrast, if you look at the red line, which is, the, which is trade in services, there the peak to trough decline is almost twice the size of what happened uh, to trade in goods. And the recovery in services trade has been much slower sort of keeping track with the gradual removal of pandemic-related restrictions, uh, and particularly that reflects uh, what's happening to tourism. Now, there are some, uh, a number of factors that could be responsible for these trends, including the rotation of preferences from services uh, towards goods. Um, also, there could be uh, another factor driving this could be increasing demand for imports to substitute uh, for domestic production, which was impaired by the pandemic. And lastly, there could be demand for uh, uh, goods to address the pandemic, such as medical goods, personal protective equipment, et cetera. So that's one set of stylized facts. Now, the other sort of motivating factor behind our analysis is the possibility that trade networks acted as a shock amplifier, given that the outbreaks of the pandemic in different regions occurred at slightly different times, although they were overlapping. And we would expect that this is especially likely in, in GVC intensive industries. And we define GVC intensive industries to include electronics, automobiles, textiles, and medical goods. So the chart on the left there uh, shows uh, uh, trade in GVC intensive goods with the blue line. And if you observe there, the decline there is much sharper than trade in non-GVC intensive goods, which is shown by the red line. 
At the same time, we observed that the bounce back of trade in GVC intensive goods was also quicker than trade in non-GVC intensive goods. So the sort of the immediate suggestion from this stylized fact is that trade in GVCs was uh, resilient in the crisis. But if you look within this set of GVC intensive goods, moving over to the chart on the right, where we look at the automobiles and the electronics sector specifically, we see that the shock to the automobile sector was very, very severe. The, that's the blue line. Um, and it didn't really recover to pre-pandemic levels in the time span that we studied, which is from January 2020 to about June uh, 2021. Even in contrast, we see that trade in electronics, um, you know, it also fell in the first wave of the pandemic, but then there was robust trade uh, in subsequently, even also in the subgroup of semiconductor industries. So overall, uh, this might convey, so, so the overall impression from the trade data is that trade was overall generally resilient, trade in GVCs was resilient, but even as even as that may be true, we are hit, the world economy has been hit by a new set of shocks which are related to the war uh, in Ukraine. Now, I must point out that uh, in our chapter, we don't uh, uh, study the implications of the war in Ukraine. We concluded our analytical work before the outbreak, uh, but we can observe uh, certain uh, implications uh, of the war. Uh, one, uh, uh, the, the one clear implication is that Russia and Ukraine are uh, important suppliers of certain niche commodities, uh, which is a chart on the left shows that uh, Russia and Ukraine have a very high share in the supply of palladium, in the supply of neon, and I point these two out because these are important inputs uh, in the electronics industry uh, and for chip manufacturing. Um, also, uh, Russia and to a lesser extent Ukraine occupy relatively upstream positions in global value chains. Uh, that's the chart in the center, which shows that uh, Russia has very high degree of forward linkages in global value chains as compared to the typical fuel exporting country, and to a lesser extent, Ukraine. And so an implication of this is that the longer sort of the, the conflict uh, is not, not resolved, or if it widens, this could have severely disruptive effects uh, for global value chains. Um, last of all, of course, we note already that uh, commodity, in commodities markets, we have observed quite a lot of disruption, especially uh, in food uh, and, and, and in fuel. So these are some of the channels through which this conflict would have implications for trade uh, and, and global value chains. So with these sort of background facts in mind, this chapter explores uh, four questions with a combination of empirical methods and modeling. First, we ask, can demand factors fully obs uh, explain observed patterns in trade in the pandemic? Here, we estimate a very simple import demand model and then analyze the residuals of that model in 2020 to see uh, how far trade deviated from this model of import demand and what factors drove such deviation. So this is the first question is with respect to domestic pandemic factors and domestic imports in a multilateral trade setting. Then we explore more the international spillover aspect uh, from the pandemic, and sp specifically, did countries trading partners' response to the pandemic, uh, in particular lockdowns, have spillover effects via a supply shock on a given country's uh, imports? And this analysis we conduct in a gravity model setting with uh, granular bilateral uh, trade data. Then we move over to an analysis of global value chains, again, uh, using trade flow data. Uh, we ask, how resilient was trade in global value chains, and what can we say about uh, changes in the structure of GVCs based on uh, trade flow data uh, in, respect, in, in response to the pandemic shock? And then lastly, we explored policies that would help to strengthen resilience in GVCs, and this is a modeling exercise in a multi-country, uh, uh, multi-sector model, uh, and we examine a set of supply shocks. So let me turn to the first question, which is that uh, what, some of the, what are the drivers of trade in the pandemic? So we estimate an import demand model, and first we check how well that model performs historically. Uh, then we derive the forecast errors of that model in the, in, for 2020, and then to the extent that these forecast errors are large, we see what is the correlation of these forecast errors with country-specific characteristics. So if you look at the chart on the left, it suggests that the model does a very good job of predicting trade flows historically. Uh, 
So the, these, these are forecast errors for trade in goods, uh, growth of trade in goods and services and aggregate trade. And what we observe is that these forecast errors are usually quite small in the typical year, even including years of crises like the global financial crisis. But when we zoom in on 2020, there we see something quite unique happens, which is that these forecast errors become quite sizable, uh, which is to say that while both goods and services imports fell in 2020, goods imports fell less than would be predicted by a model, which yields positive forecast errors, and services imports fell a lot more than would be predicted by the model, so we have negative forecast errors. Then we move on to understand what could be driving these forecast errors uh, in 2020, uh, which is to say, why, what are these demand shifters related to? And here we regress these forecast errors on country level variables and focus on the pandemic specific factors. In the, this is on the, in the chart on the right hand side. Now the chart shows us that the intensity of the pandemic mattered for, for, for goods imports. So we see that where there were more COVID cases, where the stringency of containment policies was more restrictive and where there was uh, stronger restrictions on mobility, these countries ex uh, experienced more import growth than the model uh, that would predict otherwise. Um, then with respect to services, what we find is that the model's under prediction was larger in countries which had a relatively higher share of travel in their in their total services imports, which stands to reason given the restrictions on travel uh, during the pandemic. Lastly, I would draw attention to the, the bar, second from the bottom, which shows the relationship between partner countries, health preparedness, and import demand. Countries whose trading partners had a higher degree of health preparedness in the pandemic experienced uh, more imports uh, than the model would predict, which alerts us to the possibility that there were spillover effects from COVID conditions, from the pandemic uh, in partner countries. Mm -hmm. And I will turn to the question of spillovers now. So diving into more detail on the spillover effects, uh, we ask whether pandemic containment policies could impact trade flows uh, through a contraction of the supply of goods uh, in the country that imposes impose lockdown restrictions. So here the unit of analysis is the importer country and we're interested in the effect of containment policies put in place by trade partners rather than those imposed domestically. So here we are using bilateral trade flow data as I had mentioned. Um, what we find is that in, the, uh, in, this, uh, in this framework, over the entire sample from January 2020 to June 2021, Trading partners' uh, lockdown stringency had a negative and statistically significant effect on, on, bilateral, uh, on bilateral import flows. And then when we dig down more deeper into the time profile of the spillover effect, we show this in the chart on the left, for example, what you see there is that the spillover effects, uh, the, 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 uh, the, blue, the dark blue solid bar shows uh, negative statistically significant semi-elasticities of the lockdown stringency index in trading partners. And the light blue bars show uh, the same semi-elasticity when it is statistically insignificant. Uh, the red line there is the uh, stringency index uh, within the uh, 10th and the 90th percentile. So what we observe is that the negative spillover effect was very much concentrated in the first half of 2020. There were large negative spillovers. And past June 2020, these effects become statistically insignificant and they, in, they disappear, only to make a sort of a reappearance, though much smaller, around the time of the Delta variant in April uh, 2021. So there were sharp, short-lived spillover effects uh, from pandemic containment policies in trading partners. Uh, in the period, in the first half of 2020, we perform a counterfactual analysis to, to see how much the spillovers mattered for trade. And what we find in the chart on the right shows us that these spillover effects, uh, uh, negative spillovers accounted for 60% of the observed decline in trade in the first half of 2020. So the effect was indeed quite sizable. Um, here I'll show how these effects are differentiated by some interesting dimensions related to trade and global value chains. Uh, first, the chart on the left shows that the spillover effect of lockdowns was uh, twice as high in countries whose trading partners had low teleworkability 
as compared to countries whose trading partners had high telework ability. So this ameliorated or mitigated the supply, the, the supply shock in the partner country. Then in the middle chart, we look at whether this effect, the spillover effect was mediated by whether a good was uh, produced in a GVC intensive industry or not. And again, we find uh, intuitively that imports of GVC intensive goods were hurt more uh, due to lockdowns than non-GVC intensive industries. And then lastly, we uh, look at whether uh, trade was hurt more uh, for goods that are relatively downstream as compared to more upstream. And again, intuitively, we find that trade in downstream goods was impacted more negatively than uh, trade in upstream goods. So downstream goods would then embody longer input supply chains uh, and, than upstream goods. So similar to the logic of uh, the chart uh, in, 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 the, in the middle. So now uh, let me move on to global value chains. What we are doing here is we are examining what we can learn about the evolution of global value chains using trade data in the absence of high frequency um, inter-country input-output data, which is more standard in the analysis. So what we look at is uh, changes in market shares in the key GVC regions among GVC intensive goods. We zoom in on three, the three main GVC regions, which is North America, Europe, and Asia, and then we calculate the change in market shares in, uh, in these regions vis-a-vis -vis each other as compared to the pre-pandemic. So the left panel shows you that in the first six months of the pandemic, Asia, as an exporting region uh, shown on the x-axis, uh, increased its market share vis-a-vis uh, -vis Europe uh, by 4.6 percentage points relative to 2019, and increased its market share in North America relative to pre-pandemic by 2.3 percentage points. Now, this is consistent with an asynchronous development of the pandemic and Asia relaxing restrictions earlier than Europe and, and North America. But as we move forward in time, we zoom ahead by a year, then we see that these patterns are partially reversed as countries adjusted to the pandemic. So the right-hand side panel shows that Europe partially regained some of the market share that it lost up to the first half of 2020 in the first half of 2021. And the same is true vis-a-vis uh, -vis North America as well. So at first glimpse, the evidence does not suggest that GVCs have undergone significant structural changes so far, at least in response to the, to the, to the pandemic shock. Um, and in fact, they suggest that they were able to adapt where Asia is able to provide supplies at a time when other regions' supplies are, uh, are, are, are uh, negatively impacted by the pandemic. However, as supply chains remain disrupted and still remain disrupted, which is slowing the recovery and is adding to inflationary pressures, we still need to think about policies that will uh, strengthen global value chains. So in our chapter, what we do is we, we examine two options. First is, can countries uh, diversify uh, their supplies of uh, intermediate inputs uh, uh, internationally? And second, can it be easier to substitute intermediate inputs as sourced across different countries? Um, what our, what our, the, our key finding here is that resilience to cross-border shocks can be increased with greater input source diversification and greater input substitutability although the benefits are smaller if supply shocks are more widespread and more correlated. Uh, one of the key stylized findings in the chapter is that there is a sizable home bias in the sourcing of intermediate inputs, which means that uh, any reshoring of production would lower diversification even further, and in itself this is a simple argument against uh, reshoring. On this slide, uh, I, we, I'm presenting to you uh, the benefits of uh, diversification in response to two different types of shocks. The left-hand side chart shows uh, what happens uh, if there is a supply shock in a large uh, EEM emerging market supplier country, which uh, say like China. Um, in the baseline, in the low diversification world, world GDP is reduced by about 0.8 percentage points on average. But in the high diversification world, these GDP losses are reduced by almost a half. And even China, the shocked country in this scenario, benefits as its producers are able to more easily source inputs uh, from the rest of the world. 
Now let's look at a, a different type of shock. Rather than a shock to a single country, we look at a shock which is, which is multi-country and, and correlated across countries. Here uh, we draw, a, a, we, this, the shock is calibrated in line with historical total factor productivity shocks, which have some positive correlation across countries. In this case, we find that higher diversification also uh, uh, provides uh, some benefits by reducing the volatility of GDP on average by about, uh, by about 5%. Um, let me move over to uh, substitutability. Uh, in this case, uh, what we do is we increase the uh, elasticity of substitution in, in the model from a factor of 0.5, which is uh, uh, consistent with a short-run elasticity of substitution among intermediate inputs, to about uh, to a value of 2. Um, so uh, what we find here is that in, the, in, in response to a shock in a, uh, to a large EM supplier, again, this is uh, parallel to the, to the China shock, um, the reductions in GDP uh, in this case in the high substitutability world are reduced by about four-fifths. However, in this case, China does not benefit as this shock is purely uh, uh, redistributive. So those are really the main conclusions of, the, of our chapter. And let me uh, just recap very quickly that in terms of patterns of trade, the pandemic had an important role. Um, goods imports grew by more and services imports grew by much less than would be, predict would be predicted by a simple model of import demand. Uh, and this is consistent with the rotation of preferences away from services and towards goods. We find that there were significant lockdowns from uh, uh, significant, significant spillovers from, inter, uh, from lockdowns in trading partners, uh, but they were uh, mitigated to the extent that um, uh, they would telework was possible and they were relatively short lived. Mm -hmm. We do not find evidence that they were lasting structural changes afoot in GVCs in response to the pandemic shock, at least based on evidence up to uh, the middle of 2021. And the data suggests that GVCs were adaptable and resilient overall. Finally, in terms of policies to increase resilience in GVCs, we find diversification and substitutability in intermediate inputs uh, can lower economic volatility, and there is room to increase diversification given the home bias in sourcing intermediate inputs. And with these results, we are able to come to some policy recommendations. The fact that there are strong spillover effects from the pandemic and not all regions of the world have exited pandemic conditions even today, this remains highly relevant, that we need to vaccinate widely and quickly all over the world. It's not enough to take care of the pandemic just at home. Uh, and enhancing infrastructure to help telework and to re reduce congestion in, in, in trade infrastructure will be useful. Now, when it comes to building resilience in global value chains, uh, we recognize that a lot of the effort will be made by firms themselves, and this will be costly effort. But governments can help to, by increasing opportunities for trade and by filling information gaps. Value chains can be quite complex, and um, a better un providing a better understanding of what they look like and where the risks lie can help firms make better, more strategic decisions. And governments can uh, reduce trade costs, increase opportunities for trade through reductions in tariff and non-tariff barriers, and also providing a more stable and open rules-based trade policy regime. And with that, I come to the end of my presentation, and uh, I stop there. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Adil. I think that was uh, that was quite uh, that was quite informative. Uh, I'm looking at the uh, the application. Uh, Slido and the, the, there are a number of uh, the number of questions. Um, let let me just um, let me just read you uh, some of the the, 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 the questions. And um, one question which has been picked up by several people is the following: Can you envisage a future of globalization or even localized? Wait. No, something has something has happened, and I cannot see the. Uh, I cannot see the. Uh, hmm. I cannot see the question anymore. Anyway, the 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 the, the question really was um, whether you could envisage a world uh, where there would be much less. <laughs> 
globalization. And several of the, uh, of, of the questions are related to that. I pick up one other. What effect will these developments have on uh, globalization? Will they result in a move towards deglobalization? Right. Uh, as countries try to become less reliant on uh, GVCs. Um, so I think, uh, I mean, in a sense, uh, what I missed a little bit uh, from uh, your presentation um, is the link to uh, globalization I mean, and to, to, to what I was indicating in my introduction. Um, is there, I mean, are we witnessing yes or no, or and what are, what are the channels, a structural change? So I, I, th I think what, what was very clear, and I think it, it's, it's very important, obviously, to make, to make that point uh, that, yeah, that you make and that the, the, the report uh, makes, is the importance of the GVC for the reliance, for the, for the resilience of our, of our economies, right? So there's been this debate that, in a sense, is a dependence on GVC, is it a weakness? Or is it a strength? Mm -hmm. right? And uh, I think you, you, you provide a very important, uh, important element uh, uh, of, a, of a response to, to that question. But it seems to me that independently of the fact that um, economists uh, do tend to find that uh, global value chains are an element positive in the resilience, nonetheless governments, for a number of reasons, of which the pandemic is only one of them. Maybe the pandemic has been the triggering factor to uh, underlying political elements of uh, reshoring uh, that would have occurred even in the absence of the, the pandemic. So you, you're focusing, in a sense, on, on the pandemic itself. And did the global value chains help us or make us worse uh, during the pandemic? Uh, and I think there, it's, you know, the, the, the element that you provide is, 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 very, is very, very useful. But I think the, 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 the question that are being posed, and that I have as well, is if you're looking into sort of a, a, a longer uh, period of time, uh, of which the pandemic is, is part of, uh, and there are a number of factors uh, of uh, policies. Uh, you, can one see something as to whether there are some structural, uh, structural changes taking place? Yeah. Maybe it's a question also, and uh, that is something that I, I would like you to, uh, to, to elaborate a bit. At, at what level of disaggregation? Uh, are you are you looking at the the data? It's at a sectoral level. Uh, so the the data here that we use uh, to map a trade in GVC intensive goods, the underlying data is at the six digit level. So it's very very disaggregated, uh, and then we aggregate it up uh, into sectors like automobiles, electronics, based on um, the literature which has done the mapping of the entire GVC in these industries from inputs to final goods. So that's just on the technical side. Um, and as you know, the, the, that exercise, as I, you know, at the, the caveat to that exercise is that that's a picture based purely on trade flow data. And it only provides a snapshot up to the point that we have trade flow data. It doesn't speculate on what can happen in the future. Um, but if we saw a persistent change in market share, then we would have concluded from that that the pandemic has indeed led to shifts in global value chains uh, as compared to the past, but prima facie, it doesn't appear to be the case. But I think it's a good question all the same, and I, to, give a, to give a convincing answer about what the future looks like, we would need to look at investment flows. That will, that, and this may even need to be done at a, not at a national level, but at a disaggregated firm level analysis of where are firms investing, uh, are, are firms changing, the, is the pattern of FDI and multinational corporations changing? I think that will provide a more convincing answer than um, for, for the future structure of global value chains uh, than trade data alone. Um, 
we in the model can can can, can, yes. can i just get back to you on on uh, on, on this i think uh, what you said uh, i find very very convincing uh, so you know as you said there's the caveat we are looking at trade and you know we have to extract from the trade data what we can extract and one may able to extract further information with further data and that would be data on investment but okay let's let's look at, at this as uh, with this, uh, this 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 caveat in mind you know we can only judge based on trade and we do not see much change in the shares mm -hmm. okay and so that means no structural change no your um, and I, I, I take that uh, very much as 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 a as useful element uh, can uh, what what is your year of reference uh, so again coming back a little bit in the history uh, what I said at at the at the, uh, at the start is that there had been this discussion uh, about whether or not. There, there, there is a there is a break, a structural break. Uh, that discussion started in two thousand nine, right? With the financial, with the great, uh, with the great, uh, with the great recession. Um, now you are looking. Uh, so, what 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 is what is your reading of the evidence? I mean, th there was a lot of evidence. Lots of researchers worked on. On the uh, on the financial crisis and whether the financial crisis was, as far as global value chain is concerned, was it a structural break? Yes or no? Uh, so you're looking here at the pandemic compared to the period immediately before the pandemic. Correct. Okay. So that's that's why I want to that's why I want to push you a little bit in the historical perspective and uh, whether you were able at all, although you did not report that uh, that today. Uh, to prolong your study, I mean, uh, I, I have a question really. Why is it you you start in 2018, and why is it you don't, in a sense, take advantage of the exercise that you are doing to look at the two shocks, the financial, the 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 the, 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 the global recession, 2009, which was a shock to, to the system, and then there is a second shock. And then to 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 try to get more evidence using the same uh, the same method. Uh, you see, you see my point, yeah, and yeah. also, yeah. I mean, in a sense, what is your reading of what was the impact of the uh, of uh, of the financial crisis on GVCs? So, um, okay, compared to right. twenty, what you find essentially is that compared to twenty eighteen, twenty twenty one is not very different. That's basically what you say. And I'm asking something in a little bit of more of a duration. Let's say compared to 2008, and then we have one shock, and then the second shock. What is 2021 in a sense? Do you have? I mean, did you when you worked with all the data? Uh, it would not be a very costly, obviously, to to use the data over a longer period to try to get to get a handle to that. Do, do you have a bit of a? Of an um, elements of answer to that? No, the I think the that's a very good point. Uh, we, you're correct that the window of time that we look at is uh, the pandemic and just before. That is our reference point uh, for looking at changes. We were we um, we the, the chapter was less about how have global value chains evolved, keep, uh, keep you know over the long historical time period. That was not the question that we set out to ask. But um, if we look, we did see, uh, for example, when I presented that um, panel on the change in market shares, then we looked at how do these changes in market shares in 2020 look like when we go along, for, go back in history several years. And there we see that the, uh, the jump in market shares that happened in 2020 was very sharp and quite sizable compared to the increase in, say, Asia's market share in Europe during the period of rapid globalization. So we did have, we do, uh, and that, that um, the annex uh, accompanying the chapter does have some of that longer time period and framing of that, uh, of the evolution of GVCs in mind. Uh, but, uh, but I think the, it's not front and center in the chapter. It's, we do, uh, we do note that the pace of change in the two years of the pandemic was quite rapid in comparison to the historical pace. Um, uh, so that, um, uh, but I, I have to admit that uh, we have not, 
uh, uh, looked at the evolution of GVCs from a longer perspective. Okay. Uh, from my side, one last question, uh, and I'd like to pick on, on the question that we see on the, on the screen here. How do you assess the impact of the current COVID-19 wave in China on global trade and global value chains? Seems to me that I mean to me that is the the, the crucial question. Yeah. Uh, so I I didn't hear you much talk about. I mean you had one exercise where you looked a little bit of China. Uh, I uh, and and that's again the historical uh, the historical element. Lots of things have been happening with China, in China and with China. Uh, there was obviously uh, already the the uh, the the U.S. Uh, China. Uh, trade war uh, at the time of um, uh, of Trump. Basically, the tariffs have continued with the with the Biden administration. So there is that element, and then there is the problem of the way China is handling the uh, the, the pandemic. They are not twice the same thing, but they they may be cumulative. Okay, so there may be an element, at least a question mark, that is being posed whether trading partners of China are finding China a less reliable suppliers or suppliers with whom for also political reasons one wants to disengage partly. What are you, what are you picking in, in, in the data uh, about that? Um, so the, the China yeah, issue, right, central the, to the global value chain obviously. Yeah, of course. And uh, um, I think the chapter has shown very, very clearly that there are strong spillover, negative spillover effects from lockdowns in partner countries. And that's one of the key results that we find. Um, and indeed, um, in the robustness analysis uh, of the chapter, we find that if we, you know, if we take out the Asia region, or if we take out emerging markets from the sample, then the size of the spillover is smaller. A lot of that has to do with the fact that China sits in the center of a very important global value chain. So indeed, by, and, and which is, which, um, you know, we make a strong case uh, for, a, for, a, for a pandemic response, which will mitigate the need for the kind of strong uh, uh, lockdown measures which have disruptive effects uh, through global value chains, very much speaking to, uh, uh, you know, there was a time in the, uh, when we were working on the chapter and we wondered whether was COVID already in the rear view mirror. But unfortunately, uh, it, is, it isn't, and uh, it's very much here, and uh, it's very much having an effect. Um, so uh, you know what w uh, we we so yes, there is a a strong a negative impact from such lockdowns and potentially could happen again in the future, and we would need a an approach that uh, addresses the pandemic globally. Uh, let me turn to someone in the uh, audience, uh, Marie, and I think probably you want to raise issues related to climate. Yes, please. Yeah, hi. Um, so I'm uh, Marie, I'm a fellow at Bruegel and I work on climate policies. So my question is a bit uh, looking into the future. So, you know, taking into account the caveats you said about methodology, I just want to start by asking, can you identify green technologies in your data? And do you know kind of um, what happened to the global value chains relating specifically to these goods? So solar panels, batteries, that, those sorts of things. Um, and then do you... Do you what I'm trying to get at is, um, can we foresee some supply chain disruptions or bottlenecks looking forward, you know, because the decarbonization agenda has accelerated and we just need to keep installing these new technologies. And so are we going to be facing a problem um, given all these disruptions between the health situation and also the war in Ukraine? Thanks. Thanks. That's a great question. And of course, the, the climate issue is, uh, is urgent. Um, the, uh, f f in the chapter itself, uh, we don't draw a distinction between types of goods by green versus non-green. We have looked at GBC intensive goods a bit more broadly defined. Uh, partly the limitation there is because we, the mapping of these uh, value chains uh, at the six digit level has been done for this set of industries that we that we considered. If there, were, if there is a mapping at the six digit level for green goods, then we would be able to take that into account also more explicitly. I think it's an excellent question for, uh, it's, a good, it's a great area for future research to see how these disruptions affect um, the trade in green goods. Um, but I would expect that you know, uh, um, electronic components 
at some level of uh, at some level maybe quite generic and so disruptions to the extent that they are happening in upstream suppliers of key uh, inputs in the electronics uh, manufacturing process like the you know in neon or palladium as in the, as is the case uh, there may be other rare earths that are i'm not an expert in the field but there may be other rare earths that are also uh, affected negatively by this so certainly to the extent that the conflict is pro prolonged this would have a negative impact on the on the uh, for trade in green goods um, as much as it would uh, in other value chains as well. Uh, the re related uh, related question uh, that was uh, yes that that is there. Um, so coming back to to, to the uh, question that was posed before, and again I I read the, the the question from somebody in the audience. Can you envisage a future of globalization? Okay, or even localized value chains, and let me pick more on the, the the second part of the of that question. In addition, is there a way to keep global global value chains without irreversibly sacrificing climate? So when when I, I follow the, the the discussion uh, here in uh, in Europe, um, I mean there there are two sides of the um, uh, discussion on the pandemic and trade, or the pandemic and global value chains. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, one is uh, the kind of discussion uh, that I think that the report, uh, to which the report uh, talks, uh, which is the resilience uh, issues. Okay. And in the end, finding that uh, the global value chains um, was not a weakness, uh, was an element of strength, was an element of resilience. Mm -hmm. okay? And I mean, if one, if one comes from a systems analysis, um, this, is the kind of, uh, this is the kind of answer that one would have. You know, if you're trying to look at the system as it operates, it helped us to have diversification. Mm -hmm. And diversification implies, well, the diversification can be regional, can be global, but it means you know, to have international value chains. They can be global value chains, they can be regional, but you, know, you, you, when you speak of global value chain, it's both global and, and, re and regional, really. Uh, that's one side of the, of, the, of, the, of the discussion, I think. And again, the, 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 the study uh, talks to to that uh, I think in a in a very convincing manner. Then I think there is a second uh, kind of angle, which is alluded to at least by uh, by the question here, which is um, well, trade uh, is very nice and is helping us in resilience, helping us in consumer choice, uh, lower prices, all of the benefits. Uh, all of the gains from trade that we teach to our to our students, and uh, and rightly so. But then the, the, there's there's another side so that that one hears more and more here in uh, in Europe at least, which is that uh, trade has gone too far, or globalization has gone too far. It's very costly for the climate. Uh, yes, maybe I'm able to get uh, as a consumer some goods. Uh, more cheaply by having them come from the uh, other side of the planet, but at what cost to, uh, cl to climate, which is not today incorporated fully into the transportation costs, okay? Because we don't price in uh, the fuel and uh, the, uh, the, the emissions uh, as much as, as one should. So maybe, and one heard a lot ab about that, as I say, here in, in Europe during the pandemic, maybe the a good thing of the pandemic is that it will lessen globalization and therefore it would, that would be a positive contribution to uh, the fight on, on climate. Uh, can you talk to this? Um, I, can, I can offer some commentary which is outside of you know, what's in the chapter because we don't really examine the issue of uh, trade and uh, climate, which is a really important question. Um, and deserving of uh, study, but you know, to me, uh, it strikes me that um, reshaping global value chains, if you're doing it from a climate perspective, would need to take into account more than just emissions in transportation. There are multiple costs involved, um, 
So, and there is technological change as well, and efficiency gains year after year as well. Um, so I'm just you know, not an expert enough in the field to say yes or no, uh, whether there would be net gains for the climate, of, uh, for climate uh, through less globalization, or there would be not be net gains uh, through globalization. But to me, the answer would seem to be that you need to carefully account for all of the costs and benefits from changing the structure. I mean, if it becomes, uh, I mean, climate is a global problem. It needs global resources to tackle. Um, and if there are gains, uh, uh, eventually you're going to have to pay for uh, mitigation globally. So somewhere that surplus will need to be generated. Maybe there is more of a surplus coming from more globalized world rather than a less globalized world. Could be one way of looking at it. But I mean, to to uh, to summarize, what I I think it needs a comprehensive view rather than just looking at the transport sector. Um, let me just offer you a, a comment, uh, you and the audience, a, a comment on this. I think inevitably um, we are going to be, we as, as economists, um, making analysis in this domain, um, we are confronted uh, and are obliged to, uh, I mean as economists, to, to, to provide some answers to potential trade-offs um, and you know when 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 one looks at uh, trade I mean we as economists tend to 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 look at as, as I said before sort of we have a framework of, of gains from trade and we know that in the gains from trade they also they can be also costs from trade but usually we see them as adjustment okay because it takes time to sh to uh, to shift resources from one sector to another, and the issues of unemployment and retraining, and that, those are the 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 the, the, co the costs, right? Um, but I think that more and more uh, trade and trade policy and policy makers, uh, and I know that you are going to uh, you are, you are going to uh, to uh, to Geneva uh, to talk to the uh, to the WTO and to make a, a presentation. So as one talks to uh, to policy makers, they are themselves confronted with two completely uh, different narratives. One narrative is the traditional gains from trade. Okay? Trade is good because trade enlarges the, uh, the 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 possibilities the possibilities in terms of uh, the type of goods and services that are available uh, enhances uh, productivity uh, enhances you know having lower prices all of this I think uh, those are the kind of arguments that we economists can make and make convincingly and that have been there around for 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 a long time and at the same time the policymakers uh, they are confronted with completely different kinds of demands. Um, and we see that the non-economic objectives to which they are subject and that they have to incorporate into the making of trade policy. So trade policy is not just about economics anymore or even about the political economy, that is distribution, which is economics, but also about issues like, like, uh, like climate. Okay? Nobody can ignore today the climate. And it could very well be, and I think politicians, not just trade, uh, trade policy uh, uh, people, but uh, uh, politicians in general, I think they would be willing uh, in a number of countries to say, okay, uh, maybe I have to sacrifice some of the gains that my economists are telling me I'm, I'm getting from trade. I'm may be willing to sacrifice them in order to get some other benefits which is related to climate and hence the issue of, of trade-offs. Um, and I think that matter is going, to be, is going to become incumbent upon us to give some answers. Uh, are, are, are the trade-offs too big? So what implications there are? How do we handle them? But I, I don't think that we will, we will be able to ignore them simply in our, in, our, in our analysis. And I think it's going to be, uh, uh, it, it's, it's going to be quite, uh, quite a difficult uh, issue, difficult uh, 
maybe not so much from an analytical viewpoint, but difficult from the kind of debates uh, that this is going to. But I, I think those those uh, those questions that one sees here, which which are I think very very typical questions that. You know, when you talk about globalization, that somebody is bringing in not just the efficiency part, but is bringing in the the climate issue, right. and uh, I think one 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 needs to one needs to address in in one way or the other, uh, and discuss. You know, okay. Uh, uh, Sometimes, obviously, we know that uh, one can bring in goods that come from very far, and there is some climate issues related to transportation, but maybe in terms of the growing of those stuff in in different you 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 benefit a lot in terms of less emissions. But again, one one needs to one needs yeah, to, to 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 bring uh, to bring that in. And I would just add there that both of both the trade policy issue and the climate issue are issues of multilateral importance, and they would have to be addressed in a multilateral way. I think bilateral actions or unilateral actions rather you know, may, may not be as effective. I think that's a good word of, uh, of conclusion to which uh, I would uh, certainly subscribe very fully. So Adil, I want to, to thank you uh, very, very much for coming to Brussels uh, on your way from, uh, from Washington to, uh, to Geneva uh, to share with us your, your presentation and your, your wisdom. And uh, I want to apologize to, to you and to, uh, to our audience about the, the technical uh, problem that we had at the start of this conversation, but uh, it was certainly worth uh, waiting for the, uh, for the discussion and having the, uh, the benefit of your, your presentation. So thank you. Pleasure. Thank you very much. My pleasure, Andre. Goodbye. <laughs>